Welcome to the Star of Grind. What I thought that maybe George and I do before we start talking to each other is uh, maybe do some customer discovery in the room. Um, who'd like to hear about uh, lean startups and customer discovery? Who here? Who'd like to hear about uh, the real secrets of VCs from George? Like how to raise money from George? Like what his home phone number is from George? Or, right. um, anything else you'd like to cover? Um, shout it out. Anybody want to hear something in particular? Anybody? This is your chance. <laughs> how to get a customer to want what you have? Yes. Stories that you've never told anybody before. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there might be a 30 year like uh, statute of limitations, yes. <laughs> what offers value? Great. Somebody Will else? you repeat them, Steve, so we can uh, hear? Somebody uh, asked, what offers value? Yep. A anybody else? Yes. MVP versus mature product. MVP versus mature product. Great. Right over there. Uh, building an, how do you build an incredible team from scratch? Yes. How do you get people to tell the truth? Yes. Ah, how, how do we get women in tech? How do we get women in tech to act like guys? Is that the short version? <laughs> great. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Yes. Uh, one more. <laughs> should I be? Question was: Should I be an entrepreneur or a VC? So, George, do we have enough to kind of talk? That's a lot. So, I want to, I want to start asking George some questions that, that I don't think ever got asked. And all of you know that uh, George is uh, one of the most successful VCs in Silicon Valley, and, and I'll let him tell you how successful he's been. But, but most people don't know that George actually was an entrepreneur. Um, uh, did a couple startups, worked in an incredibly uh, fast-growing company, which I'll let him talk about. Um, but, George, I met you when you were in your first startup at Katz. Is that right? Is that yeah, it was, it was 1989. So, so, full disclosure, Steve has been a mentor of mine since 1989. Actually, next to my dad, he's been my most important mentor. So that's not to butter him up, because he's going to ask me, he's not, he's gonna ask me very tough questions, which... He always has, so you need to do that. So, so George, you, that company... But that was 89, that, that that's when we met. Right, and that company, by the way, was responsible for the financial meltdown in the United <laughs> States for the last 30 years, right? Uh, why don't you tell everybody yeah. what, that, what, what thanks, thanks, weapons Steve. of mass financial destruction you invented at this company. Thank, thanks, it's mm -hmm. a great way to start the <laughs> meeting. Uh, so the company, the real founder of the company is a guy named Rod Beckstrom. And Rod traded derivative instruments um, on Wall Street. And Rod's a Stanford uh, business school guy, super charismatic, super driven, and he saw an opportunity basically to take what was done on Excel spreadsheets and move it into code that he basically charged investment bankers for on a monthly basis. Um, now, lots of the customers did not good things with the software and made huge errors, but that was the beginning of derivatives. <laughs> and what did you do with that? You were an MIT... Um, engineering grad and then a Sloan School grad, and this was your first startup, yeah. right? You were an engineer, and how'd you get to Silicon Valley? Yeah, so I, so I wasn't one of the co-founders in CATS, and we'll, we'll talk about that, but I grew up in New York City. My uh, parents emigrated from Greece in 1950. My dad worked in a light bulb factory when he got here and was an electrician in New York. Um, I learned how to not get beat up on the streets of New York when I was in, my, in the 70s. Um, and then I went to MIT after that and worked for Apple and TI. Uh, doing apps engineering stuff because I was working on uh, multitasking OS stuff at MIT and Apple recruited me when they were doing the Mac 2 FX. I remember that. So, did I so, answer your question? So you were already in the Valley when you got recruited by this first startup? Yeah, I, I, I came out here in night, summer of 86 to work for Apple. So that was, uh, I was 20. Wow. And, and what did you do in this startup? What did you do in CATS? At CATS? Yeah. Well, um, were you an engineer or I was a business a, side or? Uh, both. So uh, the funny thing was I got there and I was like, wow, there's only other four or five other people here. I'm employee number six. I'm part of the founding team. And then I realized there was about 10 employee number sixes before me. <laughs> <laughs> Which I started discovering. Um, my job then was to basically QA our code, uh, write brochures, uh, product marketing brochures, and 
people actually did product marketing brochures. And then I also had the job of going to Japan and opening our sales office and selling to people in Japan, even though I knew zero Japanese. Uh, so it was a real startup. Yeah, but most people in Japan thought I was John Travolta when I went there. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> True story. <laughs> and, but this, this was your first startup? Uh, that was my first startup. I did a little company when I was 12 writing code uh, on contract in 77 and 6502 on the Apple II for... And where'd you, where'd you park those millions? What happened? Park those millions is more like I parked those $20 bills. Right. Um, uh, no, I just used that for school. So do you think there's any correlation now that you have this perspective of, between engineers who started coding in their early teens uh, and success? Do you see that at all? Uh, to technical success, I do. You do? Yeah. So you think there's some correlation that if you've been hacking at code at 12 and 13, you kind of like them as technical co-founders now as a VC? Yeah. Why is that? Uh, because they have a passion around, there's a, something psychological, they have a passion around controlling things and building control, mm -hmm. and they usually tend to be reductionist in thinking, which is very good to learn how to build code. And I, I just find that um, co-founders with that background, they, it's, it's like they have so much practice and involvement in writing code that they don't, the code is just like swinging a tennis racket if you've played tennis a long time. They don't even think of writing the code. And I like people who are focused on the big picture who can code, not just people who can code. Yeah, it's interesting you, you say that. By the way, does everybody know the name of this auditorium? Han, or, uh, Han Auditorium? Eric Han, actually, uh, who was a uh, uh, founder of uh, multiple networking companies in the Valley, actually was coding when he was a teenager um, and did Microsoft before Microsoft did and his parents made him go back to high school and finish his uh, high school and he could have been Microsoft before Microsoft but instead he actually did it in the valley. So you became a head of sales and marketing of a startup, right? The first yeah. virtual world company, VPL? Yeah, uh, so after Katz, Katz was acquired by SunGuard, I, I joined a venture-backed company. Venture-backed is a kind of an odd word for this company but because we were backed by Thompson Ventures and our board representative was state appointed, um, which was not a good sign. Uh, yeah, and so basically at VPL, we, uh, Jaron Lanier, who's the real founder of the company, coined the term virtual reality, and that's when VR was his big thing. And so and what, people were going to live in VR. What did you so, know about sales and marketing? Um, nothing. And so were you a typical founding head of sales and marketing? Uh, probably worse. And, and did you learn anything? Oh, I, I learned a lot. Um, Top three. <coughs> number, the first thing is uh, understand that what you're selling fits more than just a short-term product need of the customer. It could also fit an organizational need. Um, it could also fit a personal interest of the buyer. And if you have all three combined, you can sell it a lot more easily. Um, the lessons I learned on selling, well, basically I have to say is, you need to listen to who is going to be doing the buying and hearing what they want. Did you, um, you can't, in reference to that question, you can't make someone want something. You can try to discover the reasons why someone might want something or, some, or have some needs. Did you know what you didn't know? I had no clue. No clue. When did you realize how much you didn't know? I still haven't. <laughs> and, I still and haven't. Then you went to Silicon Graphics, right? And big company. Yeah, after, after VPL, we, uh, VPL was acquired by Sun, we were buried behind the liquidation preference. I was broke, I went, I went on unemployment, and I was asking Steve, uh-oh, what do I do? And that was about the third time I tried to hire you, and you turned me down. I didn't turn you down. Yes, you did. I just followed, I just followed what I thought was interesting. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I think I was it's just true. dissed and didn't realize it twice. Um, so at SGI, what did you do? Um, I got there, um, they made me originally the product manager of Next Generation Graphics. Uh, and wasn't it, this their building? Is, isn't, wasn't this a Silicon Graphics building? Aren't we? Like, uh, it was near the tail end of SGI. Right. So we're kind of standing on the, the grave of your end. old company, right? Yeah, yeah right. that's right. We well, all stand on the shoulders of each other. Right, yeah, right. buried up to our necks. <laughs> right? um, so what did you learn in a big company? There's a lot of people who want to take over your territory. Right. And that one of the things I learned in the inside big, or outside the company? Both. Yeah. One of the things I learned was that we had uh, <coughs> VIPs, which are basically people we call them vesting in peace. And they didn't, want to, you, they didn't want you to encroach on their territory. There was a lot of people at the company, they were just focused on fighting for their salary. And the thing I noticed is that as the stock price of a company increases and then starts to stabilize and flatten, 
you start to lose the best people in a company. Um, and those people then start to leave and go and start their own startups. They realize, well, I'm not going to make any more money on equity here, and there's too much infighting. And then what I call uh, the circling the drain phenomenon starts. What's that? Um, where it looks like sooner or later this company is going to go down, uh, but you just don't know when, but you see it happening. And it usually starts when the company exhausts its early vision, and then it's just kind of on autopilot, uh, on building products, and isn't really thinking about uh, disrupting itself or building anything that's incredible. That's usually the beginning. It's when people get locked into, how do we defend our gross margin? Interesting. Uh, and so you've now had a career that spans venture capital and entrepreneurship and large companies. Fairly unique for VCs, right? I think so. Yeah. And so step back a bit. And when you're sitting in front of entrepreneurs pitching you, what are they don't know that you know. I mean, what, what you're looking at them with obviously not only experience as a venture capitalist, but experience as an entrepreneur. What are you thinking when you see you know, a good number of these pitches that bring you back to your days as an entrepreneur? And you're smiling, so it must be a couple of things you don't even want to share. So share those. Yeah, uh, well. Uh, is it naivete? Is it, gee, you, know, you wish they knew how hard it was? It was, gee, I'm thinking about when I did this X, and now it's easier? Or? I, th I think th the most obvious thing is that, uh, that I've seen entrepreneurs fall into during, uh, in, at any point or in fundraising? <coughs> well, let's start with fundraising, and then we'll. Fundraising, you know, there a lot of times people fall into the whole of, what do I say to get to the next meeting? It's like saying, what do I do to get to the next date with this person? Um, and it makes no sense at all. Because for me, it's never next meeting. It's do I have chemistry with the person or not? And if I don't, I don't keep meeting with them. Because I never was interested in becoming a venture capitalist to, to do venture. It's never something I dreamed of doing. Um, so for me, the chemistry with the founders are really important. That's the number one thing is, I, is I, I get a sense of like people just methodically walking through a deck and I don't hear the passion from them. It's too, it's too almost too polished. Uh, not to give grief to YC because I think they run a great program, but the founders there are so incredibly polished, I cannot sense any human underneath there. I, I, I don't like that. I like knowing the raw stuff. And, and so, so, so raw stuff is good, or authentic is good. And, and what does that mean? I mean, they strip off their clothes and dance around naked, or I mean, what's the? Um, no, I, what I like to see is that they have a belief that they're going to do this no matter if I'm going to fund them or not. No, oh, that's interesting. So, so that where I'm being used as a fuel to help them, that they don't think that I'm the end. There's lots of people come into my office that think I'm the end of the process. No, I'm just a little piece of the process. I'm the fuel to help you build a company. I'm not the person that builds the company. You as the founder builds the company. So there's, there's also some mistake sometimes where people say, well, you know, you're involved in this company and this company this company. If I get you, then I will be that successful. And it's not necessarily <laughs> true at all. In fact, uh, the founders always dependent on their own abilities and investors and advisors can help. That's a, another misconception. And so how do people get meetings with you? Well, that's, <laughs> um, you know, uh, no, I wake, in general, not, yeah, not today. I, w I wake up uh, in the morning, I have five to ten new emails from founders saying, I'm working on this thing, this is the best thing ever, do you have time tomorrow to meet at one? I, <laughs> uh, I appreciate their initiative, I really do, but I usually, my schedule usually books a couple weeks, and then by the end of the day I have another five or ten. So in my career I've, I've looked at well over 20,000 companies uh, in terms of email or talk to founders. 20,000 companies? I stopped counting at 20,000 five years ago. Wow. Um, and you think that's typical of VCs? Yeah, I, I do think venture people see a lot. And I've invested in 23 companies in my career outside of some seed investments. So that's a thousand to one? It's a, or worse. Or worse. Yeah. And why is that? Um, why is that? Because uh, I don't really get excited about a lot. And the truth. And excited people, markets, are you, you right? Different VCs have invest in different areas, I mean, meaning either in people or in teams and markets and timing and what's your for, stick? For me, it's, it, it, for me, it, I've actually just recently figured this out, which is after doing this for se venture for 17 years, I figured out almost all the investments I wrote a check into, it, I had to have the feeling, <coughs> would I be a co-founder of this company? That oh. is the single best investment question that I've asked myself in my entire career, and I think it's largely responsible for all of my, the, the positive decisions I've made. And give me a, give me a couple of examples. 
Um, well, the last investment I made was in a guy named Sebastian Thrun, a company called Udacity that Steve knows um, and that I know of. Uh, some of you might know it. And I, I knew Sebastian for a while, and we were brainstorming about education. But when he was talking about the company, I was so excited by what he was doing that it could change the world. And for me, I'm the first person in my family tree to go to college. So I love what he's doing, and it can change the world, and it can be a great business. So that, to me, is just I get naturally excited about that. I mean, as, a, as my job as an investor, I mean, I always pictured myself as funding revolutionaries, probably because I'm from a somewhat unruled and really poor part of Greece. We've never respected the government of Greece. Um, Neither do any of us now. So well, yeah, it's, I'm glad. <laughs> everyone's, everyone's finally caught up. Um, and I think that's part of it, is that while I've always had a desire and some, uh, I've shown the tendencies of being a founder, I really want to back people who change the world. That's the most important thing at, for me at the end of the day. So aren't but you I have to do that through a business. And so I aren't you I don't doing believe nonprofits work. Financial calculations, or is it the first thing, this passion of I want to be a co-founder? I mean, you're looking at. Such I have a this market. feeling of like, do I want to join these people? Do I want to be around them to build this company? And and then what comes next? Do you do analysis or? Um, well, with Sebastian, after an hour, I offered him five million dollars at 25 post, <laughs> which some very smart people told me, "Wow, that's a bit high, don't you think?" Did you, Did he take it? Yeah, he looked a little puzzled <laughs> about why it was that high. All right. Well, did anybody follow on? I mean, did he get more investment? No, I, want, I believe in the company, so I want to have ownership. I'm not an asset allocator. Did he raise more money for Udacity, though? Yeah, he did. He just raised a Series B from Mark Andreessen and Peter Levine of, of A16Z. So at a higher valuation than you put in. Yes, thank you, Mark Andreessen and Peter Levine. <laughs> so, okay, well, I yeah. think that's kind of interesting. And so when, when, you're, when you're sitting in a room, do you remember anything you did as an entrepreneur when you're on boards? Um, I mean, do you give advice based on your past experience? Does it help you give better advice? Yeah, make, it does. And how, how so? Uh, particularly around hiring and uh, raising capital. Um, I've had to hire people, and I've had to <coughs> fire people. And I think I'm lucky because I was born with uh, a very involved mom and two sisters, and my crazy Greek grandmother lived in the basement. Yes, like the movie. And... Um, <laughs> And so I, I have a tendency to feel things more intensely. And so I have, I have a good sense of, of people and intuition, wh whether they're a good fit for a company. And so what do you think founders, uh, you've now sat on how many boards? 23 boards or 20 boards? In my career, life? Yeah, yeah. yeah, 23 boards. Yeah, so you've now seen enough of a pattern. But by the way, I just want to observe to the rest of you, uh, this used to be the mistake I made when I was a founder, is I would see one VC and maybe two in my company. What I didn't realize is they were sitting on five to ten boards at a time. Yeah. And so the ratio of their learning was at minimum. You know, e even if they weren't doing any pattern recognition, they were seeing five to ten x more than I was every six weeks. Yet I was just seeing one of them. And you know, what you don't even recognize as an entrepreneur is they're pulling up in the parking lot. They got to look up your name. <laughs> I mean, they don't even like remember who you are until the day you say, I, I think. I think we've, we might have a liquidity event here. And then all of a sudden, you're the most important one. But what, what, are you kind of, what, what kind of heuristics do you derive now? You know, after? here's a really simple one I learned when I was doing startups, which is uh, in the first company, Cats, if you asked everyone in the company what the company did, they told you exactly the same thing. And it wasn't because they were brainwashed by Rod, the founder. The next company, VPL, if you asked everyone in the company what they did, everyone gave you a completely different answer. So what that told me was that we had a founder, in that case, who had a vision but couldn't specify it with clarity and detail. There was no focus. And without that, all companies end. You cannot exist without focus. You can't actually execute and win. So you mean a diagnostic might be for... Yeah, so, so interesting, yeah. diagnostic as a founder is ask everyone in the company what the company does and what the number one goal is. And if, and if you, you have divergent opinions, then you need to basically fix that. And the fixing of it is understanding what your vision is and why it makes sense and why it's exciting and then what the product set is that materializes that vision. And what happens if founders can't agree, co-founders can't agree? Well, that's like 75% of the time. Right. Um, what happens? Is it, do you stick with it or <laughs> the teams yeah, melt down? Yeah, I, I, I do. I think the, um, well, we can use an example. Um, I'm the original investor in Twitter. I invested in Odeo. 
And uh, before Odeo became Twitter, it was a really disaster-prone company. Um, <laughs> there were other founders of the thing called Twitter, Noah Glass and Florian. Um, and of course, they wanted me to fire Evan, um, who was, and they wanted me to fire Evan and make them the CEO. Evan wanted me to fire them. Um, so no one was talking in the company. In, in a funny way, Twitter is the exact product of who they are. They hate confrontation. So what better way than to basically send someone a direct message on Twitter <laughs> or a message and have actually see them face to face. So the funny was thing- Was the first message you, you're fired on Twitter? Was that that? No, actually the first use case of Twitter inside of Twitter uh, was for part of the company to go out drinking in the mission without telling the other part that they wanted to escape from. <laughs> True story. <laughs> they had no idea what to use it for early on. Evan didn't have an, uh, a great idea. The person who did was Jack. And Jack explained it to Evan. I was sat in the meeting. He says, this is RSS for SMS. And Evan said, oh, OK. So it's like a blog, but you don't have to write a lot. <laughs> that was Twitter? That was Twitter. Uh, interesting. That was, that was Twitter. And at the beginning, it was a very confused situation. Um, Evan was thinking about going down four different routes. And uh, last summer, he sent me a note saying, hey, I found this email saying, like, I think you should pick this route. And my email basically said, I think you should pick this route because whenever we're talking about it, everyone seems the most energized. All the other routes, everyone's talking about what the market size is. So how do you... So, so there's a passion versus, quote, unquote, market size. So how do you get founders to follow their passion rather than do the last thing a board member told them, including you? Well, the, the best way is to make decisions out of desire and not fear. And I'm not saying that uh, you can eliminate fear from your life. But I, I found the worst decisions I've made in my life have been out of fear. Um, tell, tell me more. What, is, what does that mean? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I'm trying to think what example to use without completely embarrassing myself. Um, That's what this is for. That's what Derek yeah, is hoping, that yeah, we have some real quotable moments here. Yeah, I would say I'm trying to think of... Uh, How about one in the SGI? A fear-driven decision? Yeah, yeah. Near the end, that was kind of a fear-driven company, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I think the number one, well, actually, I'm going to disprove myself in using this example. Okay. So there was someone in the company who was running a different division who wanted to take over our division. And I said, wow, if they do this, we're kind of toast. They were running this thing called Silicon Studio. You probably know who I'm talking about. I know about. exactly who you're talking about. And... Um, they were going around saying, this is going to be the next generation gaming console. We're going to take the IP we created for Nintendo and give it to other companies. So I got a call from the chairman of Nintendo who saw this quote uh, and heard about this and basically said, this is a big problem. What do you think I should do? And I thought to myself, I was like, OK, uh, I'm really nervous about this because I could get fired. So what I should do is just tell him to avoid it and we'll deal with it internally. What I did is a little bit ballsier, is I went to the chairman and CEO of Silicon Graphics, to McCracken and Germlack, uh, through my boss, Wei Yen, and I told them, uh, I just got a call from the chairman of Nintendo, and he's, he wants to fly here and basically rip up our contract if this continues. So the problem went away. Um, and it was... So you didn't operate out of fear. You actually... Yeah, I, I had fear when it was going on, but I had to do it. But you did the right thing. I did the right thing because Nintendo would have just ripped up the contract. And it was someone else on a lark wanting to build out their own empire instead of SGI. So have you ever been on, uh, on a board where board members disagreed? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, from the entrepreneur's point, anybody ever been on a board like that? It's kind of like watching your parents fight. Um, yeah. It's pretty destructive. It's incredibly destructive. Yeah. And so now that you've been on both sides, how, would, how should an entrepreneur deal with that? Um, I always tell founders that a board is kind of like the multi-headed hydra. And as long as the hydra has enough food to eat, it, the heads don't go crazy. So you as the founder have to basically lead and push a vision um, and what you're doing. The moment that a board of investors starts thinking that you've lost your confidence, then they start to feel that anxiety, and then they usually take that anxiety on the founder, you know, by either asking 10 trillion questions or saying, oh, I think you need to hire a CEO. Um, there's a whole bunch of ways it comes out, but 
I think the best way to avoid those board situations is just to say, my life depends on these decisions. What do I need to do? So you just think it's because they're, they're not busy enough? Uh, have you, <laughs> the VCs, I mean, have you ever seen malice? Sure. Really? Yeah. I was on a board of a company in the late 90s, one of the, the most famous venture people now, uh, I wish I could say it was, um, and it never had a, I never, we never had any other erratic board meetings. But for some reason, that day, he reacted to the founder um, in a really bad way. So, yeah, so this, this venture investor, he is viewed to probably be the most successful financially venture investor in the business right now. Um, has a ton of success. And in this meeting, uh, we had an 83B election. Which uh, means what? Uh, oh, sorry, we had, we, had, we had just recruited a VP of marketing, and um, we gave them a, uh, a, a, the option to buy, basically buy stock. And the company was starting to run down on money, and uh, my board member basically said, well, how much money is this stock? And it was about $500,000. And the person basically lived in a $600,000 house. So my board member said, the company's screwing up. They keep blowing money. Shinchi's on the management team. I'm going to make her sell her house or mortgage it and force her to pay the, the stock into the company. Or we're firing her. Now, that's a great VC story. Um, it was pretty ugly. That, that, that was the, I think that was the oddest thing I've ever seen. And, and no, that's not true. That's, that's, ah, there we, that's not true. Now you're that's about to true. get your money's worth right here. What's, what's the oddest thing, George? Um, the oddest one uh, was, uh, yeah, statute of limitations. I don't care anymore. Um, uh, there's a company I was really involved with called Shutterfly, which was founded in my office in February 99 with Dan Baum, Eva Manolis, and Jim Clark. How many people in here know who Jim Clark is? That's good. <coughs> um, so uh, there was a day that uh, Dan Baum, who was the real founder of the company, was experimenting with this idea of anyone being able to post video online and share kind of funny videos, which back then Jim thought was the stupidest idea. So Dan brought up in a board meeting, and I said, I think we should really do this. So Jim got completely furious. He said, this is stupid. You guys are going to blow my money. And he says, we need to take a break in the board meeting. So he's now calling the shots of the board meeting. Jim walks into the bathroom, and he goes, you come with me. I'm thinking, OK, we're going to have a meeting in the bathroom. It's a little odd, but it could happen. <laughs> Jim kind of pulls down his pants and starts going to the bathroom, the not pleasant kind, I'll put it that way. And he leaves the stall door open, sitting down, <laughs> basically yelling at me, <laughs> with employees coming in, seeing what's going on, and then like making believe they're washing their hands at the sink and then walking out. <laughs> and Jim basically said, if we do this stupid video idea, you know, I will walk off the board and I will claim no association with this company ever again. And if you do this, that's what's going to happen. And so Shutterfly didn't become YouTube because uh, Jim Clark was in the bathroom yeah, going Yeah, and, and it's actually forced, what it did is, it was worse than that. It forced the structure, it forced the culture of Shutterfly to basically be not creative. If you look at the product roadmap of Shutterfly now, it's exactly what we talked about at the beginning. Um, and it was because Jim injected so much fear into the board meeting that unless we didn't do that, he was going to walk out and leave. So how do founders deal with toxic boards? Well, what, what would that you, was a really bad situation. Yeah, what would, but in general, what would be your advice? Um, I think the most important thing is you, uh, as a form of protection, do need to have board control of the board. Really? I would suggest that. Ah. I would suggest that. And your other five partners I, at CRV, would they agree with you? I think they would. Yeah. I mean, w the thing that I've learned in venture, and most people in venture have been around long enough to actually have good results, is you never make money through the terms. Like, venture, like, uh, venture firms don't make money through terms of, of things that w don't work out. You can't have a successful venture firm doing 2x or 1.5x returns. You just can't. And all those big winners are driven by the great things that happen. The great things that happen are usually built by what I call designing for success. 
So having the right amount of cap table for the company and building the right kind of culture so that it can actually succeed and having a founder-driven culture versus an investor-driven culture. Um, well, say that again. Founder-driven culture versus investor-driven culture. Yeah. But the Valley has kind of been an investor-driven culture, hasn't it? Um, it has been. I, I, I think it's been in a big point of transition since 95. So this is a big idea. I mean, right? Yeah. Uh, having a VC sitting up yeah. here and tell us that founders need to have control of the board. Right? Yeah, in Which fact, is, so I'm negotiating on an, a, a fantastic new company. I can't wait to become an investor. And right now, so I told the founder, she's, <coughs> she's an amazing founder. Um, the, the product is her. So one of the things I love about uh, founder-centric companies is the founders live out the product. And she comes from a very, very remote part of the world um, and came to Silicon Valley um, with no network or connections. And she built this, and she's doing phenomenally well. Um, I wish I could say more, but w uh, when I was talking to her two days ago, I said, hey, in the term sheet, I don't have any issue about giving up whatever you need in terms of control around M&A. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, do you realize that in your existing term sheet from other investors, you might have a term in there that says they control whether, you, whether the company gets sold or not? And I said, you don't want that. And she said, really? Why don't I want that? And I said, because you need to decide whether you're going to sell the company, not the investors. Wow. And she was surprised. And the reason why I said that is, in my experience, um, if you don't back the founders on an on what they want to do, you're usually kind of toast because the founders, I believe, always see problems and opportunities way better than the investors or board members do. Wow. They're, just close, they're just closer to it. And plus, if they want to sell the company um, and you don't, what are you going to do? So I, I just had this with Yammer. Yammer was acquired by Microsoft. And uh, David Sachs, who's the founder of the company, who I, who I met through Elon Musk 10, 12 years ago, David says, Microsoft came back. They're willing to pay $1.2 and then for five minutes went on. It's it, it's incredible price to sales, and the stock market's going to end, and Facebook, blah blah blah, IPO. And the, so I was like, I was like, I was just trying to get in aware. I was like, David, and he's like, kept going. And they said, What do you think? I was like, um, if, Do you want to sell the company? He goes, Yes. I said, I'm there. And he's like, Oh, wow. so he was surprised for their. He, he thought there'd be pushback. Got it. Let's use this to segue to one of the questions that got asked about women in Silicon Valley. And yeah. I think since you and certainly since I've been in the Valley, it's gone from a white boys and white shoes kind of Valley to kind of uh, certainly more multicultural. Yes. And we're seeing uh, now in the last five years uh, um, uh, the growth of women participating as well. What's going on? They, do they play by different rules or are they still playing by boys' rules or... Are they, say they? Uh, women? Are they oh. uh, uh, are they smarter, better, different, same? What do they need to learn? Wow, that's a good question. Um, do you see any? I see female founders about one out of twenty times. Better than fifteen years ago, right? Probably. Right. Probably, but not significantly. Do they need to do something different? Do you fund them at the same ratio? I think that was kind of the general question. So. Yeah. Um, hey, look, I, I, I don't care if the person's male, female, uh, or, or anything. The only thing I care about is whether the founder is living out a passion and is committed to change the world. That's what I like. Good. Then I'll ask you the embarrassing question yeah, is, how absolutely. many women have you found, uh, funded? Um, well, hopefully this will be my first one as the CEO. Right, right. But in terms of founding teams, um, I'd say one out of, probably two out of 23. Wow. And, and, and being on the founding team. Okay. And, and I'm going to ask you the last... One of, one of those founders is here. Oh, great. Raise your hand. Oh, there she is. Right. Yeah, mercy. Um, I'm going to ask you the last question, and then you get to ask me some questions. But the last question is, how do you think having a family changes entrepreneurs? How does it change anyone? Yeah. Um, it's... You know, it's another responsibility, and it's a major responsibility, and it's, it's in my own belief, uh, getting married and having kids is the best thing I've ever done in my life. But if you're a founder? But if you're a founder, you... you have to understand what's important to you and when. Uh, I think the hardest part about it is figuring out where and how to allocate your time. Um, certainly before I had kids, I had an intellectual idea of what it was going to be like, but not until I got there. 
I, I think the hardest thing is how to satisfy your own responsibilities towards the company, towards your family, and towards yourself, while also staying sane. I think it's incredibly difficult. I've seen very few people do it successfully. And where's very our rank in, um, in having fun in the valley? Where would you rank your family? Where would you rank your family? Career, family, startups? Where would I? Yeah. Well, for me, it's uh, my number one thing that I focus on more than making any amount of money or anything else. I mean, the true measure of success is whether you have happy kids um, that are well-adjusted and can be good people. That's what I think. Uh, that's the kind of family my wife and I both came from. Um, thanks. Yeah. Well, though, though I will tell you that uh, um, it's, it's very funny that in Silicon Valley, and I've been doing this survey with my students now for the last 10 years, a disproportionate number of founders come from dysfunctional families. Yes, it's very true. Um, and, and for those of you sitting it's in the room true. looking at each other, making sure that no, one, no one's figuring it out, um, it, the survivors of dysfunctional families have a, have a um, for the first time in their lives, a success factor in this valley that they've never had, and that is yeah. the ability to operate in chaos uh, while everybody else is melting down. Uh, they're going, really? Somebody quit? We're screaming at each other? Normal day at home. Um, <laughs> and no one died. You know, pretty good day. Um, yeah. And with the only uh, bad news about that is that CEOs who come from dysfunctional families do great until you find a repeatable and scalable business model. And then when you need to execute on a regular basis and do the same thing every day, you'll find those same CEOs throwing hand grenades into their own company to keep so chaos bored. going they're bored. on. They're bored. And, and bored and everything else. Uh, so for those of you who are recognizing either you're working for one of those people or you are one of those people, pay attention here. It's actually good to a point and then bad later on. And then um, after you make all the money, that's when you hire enough shrinks to repair the rest of your life. Um, <laughs> And by the way, the reason why I personally know this is one of my mentors was a, one of the first uh, women VCs, Catherine Gould, um, and, and I had thought I had recognized this pattern. And I went to Catherine, and I said, Catherine, did you ever notice that, you know, the great CEOs, dysfunctional families? And she looked at me like it was the stupidest thing I'd ever said because she's next words were, Steve, why do you think we invested in you? <laughs> she said, all my CEOs. Uh, she said, I invest in those as a pattern because you guys just overachieved. So yeah. all right, your turn to ask me some questions. Well, okay. Or you could ask them to ask me some questions. Um, by the way, uh, before we get into this next piece, do you, thank you for the heads up. Uh, are we covering the kinds of topics that you want to hear about or yes or no? OK. Yeah. So, uh, so, Steve, your route to becoming the Steve of now has gone through lots of different turns and twists. Um, Attention deficit disorder. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, is the, what is the most important thing you learned as a founder uh, to, make the, to make a company successful? If there was one thing. Um. You know, you were saying it is what you look for as an investor, um, and I never understood it at the time because it was just part of my DNA, but you have to be a true believer. Um, you know, as passionate as I was about some companies that were truly losers, I was never lying. That is, I might have been wrong, but when I woke up in that morning and when I went to bed that night, I believed 500% on that I was on a mission from God, and this was it. And, and it was one of the eight things I was doing in my career. You know, enterprise software, video games, military intelligence, didn't matter. This was it, and I was a believer. Um, and, and, you know, this made me think only decades later that entrepreneurship is not a job. Not a job. Entrepreneurship is a calling. It's a passion if you're a founder. Now, you might be employees, and yeah, you, you have a job. But if you want to found something, and you're here in the valley because it's cool, you're in the wrong place. This is like being an artist and a sculptor um, or a composer. Because you're going to be dealing with some of the world's most miserable days. People will quit. You'll run out of money. You, you know, the toilets will st stop up, and you, you're the janitor as well. Or literally, you know, screaming matches with co-founders. Unless you're driven to make something happen out of nothing, You'll go, what do I need this for? 
but, but if you're driven, those are just obstacles you remove. And I guess that was the yeah. biggest thing I learned. So uh, in your experience, have you learned that building a company successfully, is it a deterministic process? Can you, can you build a deterministic process to build a billion dollar company? You know, given that I now teach a deterministic process, it's a funny question, right? The, <laughs> the Halloween startup movement started because I went and, and actually did a post-mortem on 21 years in eight startups as an entrepreneur. And it's a funny conundrum. Uh, you know, people love lean startup, customer development, business model canvas, uh, particularly engineers, because, oh, I found the formula for success. Uh, you know, let me be the first to call bullshit on that. I mean, there is no formula for success. What we now know is how to make startups fail less. We don't know how to make you individually succeed more. We now know how to eliminate, in a room like this, all the stupid infant mortality dumb things we used to do about wandering, you know, in 15 different directions. This whole lean movement and stuff I teach is all about focusing your minimum time, money, and effort, because you have a finite amount of those, on the right directions. Um, and so it won't make, I could point to company X and say, do these things, and therefore follow this spreadsheet or flowchart, and you will succeed. I can tell you, though, across a portfolio like yours or in an accelerator or, again, a, a room full of uh, potential entrepreneurs, we can increase the IRR, which is a big idea. And, and, and if we teach this, you know, every place that the minimum requirement is, now every entrepreneur needs to be able to describe what's their business model, how am I testing hypotheses, and how am I building my product iteratively and incrementally, if we now make that kind of the minimum game of entry into entrepreneurship, I think we'll get a better success rate overall, but we still can't yeah. call winners and losers. So I guess I'd say it's nature and nurture. Got it. Uh, so, so then if you look at, on the investor side yep. of things, you know, I, I find that when the market gets frothy, venture investors, including myself, tend to over market uh, <laughs> the value add uh, right. of venture investors and what, how we can help. If, from your experience, what is the real value add of good investors versus not, right? Because I think it's a very hypey subject and you've lived building success, you've had some failure. What's your honest assessment of... A VC's what? value add? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I, I, honestly, uh, George, I hate to tell you, after 20 years, the, the best value add was cash in that check. Um, thank you very much. And the other value add is the part that you guys as a community do the world's worst job in communicating, and I inferred it uh, earlier, is you guys have pattern recognition experience. And somehow you don't explain it like that. You explain it as individual sheer genius on the part of you, the investor, or whatever, instead of just saying, let me explain to you that while you're, you, Mr. Founder, are seeing one company, yours, I'm sitting through 10 to 15 companies in the same domain. And let me explain to you what I'm seeing in the industry and how founders have failed and whatever. And therefore, when I'm opening my mouth, I'm going to tell you in a board meeting whether this is my hot opinion of the day or I, have, I am seeing this movie unfold outside the bounds of your company. And if it were explained like that, then smart founders will go, oh, either the VC is having a bad day or holy cow, they're trying to give me some pattern recognition advice about stuff that's going on elsewhere. That could be incredibly useful. Um, yet I've never heard it framed like that because there was always a large ego component of I'm a VC and you're just the dumb founder. Um, luckily, I believe, that, as you've now kind of understood, it's the, the, other way around. The, the valley is kind of like <laughs> now recognizing it's the powers in the other direction is, excuse me, you fund the money we make for you guys. Um, and it truly is, though, the value add you could bring has never been articulated in a way that I've found particularly, are they having a bad day or is it experience? Does that make sense? I don't know if that's yeah. fair, but that, that's... Yeah, I think that's very fair. So uh, another important area that I see a lot of co-founders having problems with is finding a great co-founder. They can't define who's great versus who's not, and they get pulled down into this kind of cesspool of analysis where they can't, it's like check boxes. Right. Um, it's a frequent problem. Uh, how do you know, first of all, what's the best way to find a co-founder? And the second of all is, how do you know if you have the right one? Yeah, uh, you know, um, are you waving or telling us we have five more minutes? Okay, we'll, we'll speak faster. Um, 
Uh, you know, that's a great question. It's, um, I did eight startups, and three of them I did with the same team. Um, and, uh, I, and I now have a heuristic, at least even in my classes, that during a semester or quarter, which, you know, not that much pressure, though if you take one of my classes, there's a lot, um, a, about a quarter of the teams melt down even in the class. Um, and I think that's probably true before, no, the, you know, when you have the heat sun and there's a gun to your head, you get to find out whether everybody steps up or not. And the time to do that, by the way, is not in a startup. Just as an aside, uh, there never was a way for you to test before whether the group of people you're thinking of founding a company with actually is going to last. Um, I would take a startup weekend next class or even a startup weekend class. A startup weekend is free. Startup weekend next is five weeks and 300 bucks in hundreds of cities across the U.S. Try to do a startup where it's not, you're not betting the next three or four years. You'll find that the characteristics that work for you as a co-founder might not be the characteristics that work for someone else. Some of you just might want somebody who's smart. Some of you might want a shoulder to cry on. Some of you might be looking for, you know, what are the complementary skills or a hustler, a hacker, and a designer if you're doing a web startup? Okay, I checked the box. Well, for those of you who just think it's a, a box checking exercise, they're going to be incredibly uh, confused and depressed because uh, under stress, those are the last things you're thinking about. What you're thinking about is when the stuff hits the fan, are your co-founders there working with you to work through the problem, or did they check out? Uh, because let me tell you, the stuff will hit the fan a lot, either in disagreements or, you know, the customers don't, like, bother to read your plan, so they're not, you know, they're not buying or using or whatever. Um, and so I, I think there's more about the emotional chemistry than it is a, a checklist. A checklist is a great thing to start with for complementary skill sets, but this emotional component under stress is just important to test out. Um, and, or, or else you're going to be surprised and uh, it'll be expensive to fix later. So hypothetically, let's suppose you're in a situation where an investor says, I'll fund your company, but you have to fire your, your co-founder because I think they aren't good. Yeah, that actually happened to me in my last startup, as you know. Um, my uh, co-founder and partner, and he had been a mentor my career, Ben Wegbright, um, I'd say half the VCs who uh, talked to me said, Steve, we love you, but Ben's insane. Um, which, and, and there were other words used as well, and I said, you know, might be, but that's my co-founder, and you're wrong. Um, I've worked with Ben for 20 years, and there's no way we're going to build this company without him. Um, and they passed, and I passed. And at the end of the day, I was right. I returned a billion dollars each to the two investors who did give us money. And Ben was integral to, I mean, integral. He was, did more than half the work in the company. They were just wrong. Um, but they could shake you. You know, I actually had to walk around the block a lot and think about, do they know something? I, and I went, no, they're wrong. Uh, I did have to tell Ben that this was actually, you know, why we were getting passed and I was going to stick with him, but he should know about it as well. Uh, so it was a tough conversation. I've also, you know, Epiphany actually had a fifth founder. And, you know, our fifth founder wasn't comfortable in the way we were organizing the company, and she decided she didn't want to stay. You know, I sent her a copy of the... S1 offering when we were done. <laughs> that happens. Um, so, uh, so the, you know, we talk about technology, we talk about founding, we talk about funding, but we don't talk about the team and the interpersonal relationships a lot, and I think we're getting smarter in the Valley, and I think the best advice I could give any of you is actually do a trial marriage before you get funded with the team under high pressure, um, and don't be embarrassed if, like, it blows up, as I said, there's a good percentage of them that never make it to first funding, and you might as well find this, this out now. Yes. That is exactly right. I don't, I don't have any, I have so many Who questions. Who has the best too, question in the room? Yes. Who wants to ask George or I anything? Best question. Back, all the way in the back. Ask it. Yep. Yeah. What's the question? Okay. Um, my investor, straight after launching the product, comes to me and says, well, great, you've got the product now. You don't need any more money. And I'm saying, look, I need six months to market the product, but... What's the question? Okay. <laughs> when you get a real asshole investor, what do, you do? what do you do about it? They're already invested and on your board? Yes. 
Well, uh, <coughs> there's only one thing you can do is confront the person uh, and confront the situation and try to get to the root of it versus being continuously harassed by the style. Uh, I think that's just the answer in general for when you have to deal with difficult people. And, and, and let me give you mine now after 20 years of having been an entrepreneur, encountering this a couple of times. Um, and I'm going to give you the less polite version of George. Uh, you've got to let people, particularly investors and board members, know you can't be taken hostage. Um, and if you're not prepared to quit and walk out of the company and take your co-founders with you, you are going to be held hostage. And, and it's just a simple, polite discussion, but just simply says, some, yeah. somehow we're confused about who's steering the ship here. And this isn't going to work. And if you're willing to walk away from your money, I'm willing to walk away from this company. So let's have this discussion. But if you're, if you're too fearful or you think you have too much invested, you're screwed. Yep. Who has one more great question? Right up here. Any That's, good advice on how to find a, um, a great mentorship like yeah. what, you have, what so, you have here? So I kind of think of the question was, you know, how do you find a great mentor? And the answer is kind of zen. Uh, you, don't, you don't ask for one. Um, I think of uh, three types of advice you'll need in your career. Somebody who teaches you something, you pay money for, to acquire a skill. Somebody who coaches you, could be in an advisory board, could be something else. Uh, again, you want to solve a particular problem for a particular domain. But I use the men word mentor uh, for something very special. You get mentors for about 10 or 15 years in your career, sometimes from your late 20s or 20s to maybe mid-30s. Uh, and these are people who have seen more than you have, and they're interested in your career in life, and you can't ask for them. The way I ended up getting mentors is unconsciously, what I didn't realize is I was giving back more than I was getting. It's a big idea. If all you're doing is asking, can somebody be my mentor, you're kind of missing the point. If you're not interesting enough and, and you know, crazy enough or whatever, then you're not, you're not going to be able to give back. And the sad part is, and it's bittersweet, is that after a while, while well, I said this only lasts 10 or 15 years, is all of a sudden you outgrow your mentor and you end up mentoring the next generation. It's actually kind of a neat feeling when you realize, oh my gosh, now I have people I'm mentoring. George, any comment or does that? I think that's a good Great. answer. How are we doing on time? Give them a done? big round of applause. Great. Can I?